uh, just there's several things that we do in interventional neuroradiology or neurointerventional surgery. I'm going to concentrate on stroke therapy and cerebral aneurysm treatment. Um, since Dr. Vadla Moody did a beautiful job on stroke therapy, I will briefly go over that, and then I'll talk about some uh, aneurysm cases. But you see there's a wide breadth of what we do. Next case, please. Next slide. So uh, time is brain. He alluded to this already. We know that every minute, almost 2 million brain size cells die, almost 80,000 strokes in the United States every day. And it is a very big high burden for related disability and cost to the, to the society and patients that don't do well. Next slide. So I'm gonna concentrate on the thrombectomy devices that we use, aspiration. And again, Dr. Vad already talked a lot about this. Um, the stent retriever here is an example of clot in an open stent retriever. And the idea is to incorporate the thrombus into the stent wall and then to bring it out under direct aspiration. Next slide, please. So again, this is a 90 year old, but almost similar to his case. Uh, Right-handed female lives independently at home. She has AFib. She's on Eliquis. And even though she was last seen normal about four hours from the time we got her on the table to imaging, she was not a candidate for IV um, thrombolytics because of her Eliquis. Her CTA beautifully shows this truncate, truncated middle cerebral artery. Um, you can see the normal side and contralateral. Uh, we have we use Rapid AI, which is an advanced platform that uses cerebral blood flow and also the Tmax um, that shows us the infarcted core, which is pretty small in this case, but a very large, the green is the area of penumbra or brain at risk. It also gives us a, sn a snapshot of the arch. She was a type two arch. I did not have to do a direct carotid stick, but I sort of grimaced when I saw his case because those do happen. And it means that you have to be adaptable and ready to change your approach. Next slide. Her stroke scale is also moderately high at 13. So we use an aspiration. A lot of times we will try to aspirate the thrombus first as our catheters are becoming larger and larger bore and the technology is increasing. We can actually rapidly get up to the face of the thrombus most cases. Um, so with one pass of the catheter, we were able to bring out quite a bit of clot. Can you advance? There is a picture, I believe, of the clot if you, if you scroll forward. She, we, we, we obtained large thrombus fragments from this uh, nice lady. She was able to go home five days later with a stroke scale of zero. Again, he talked about the thrombolysis, ischemic cerebral, um, or the score, and TIKI-3 is the best. It means you recanalize all the vessels distally. Next slide. So, Stroke therapy, endovascular stroke therapy is really changing stroke outcomes, and this is even a little old. Um, there's just positive movement all the time. There are several, several trials ongoing. Remember, we started this with our first endovascular tool in 2004. I was around and used the Mercy device. It was a cumbersome device, typical, difficult to use, um, but our ability to aspirate or remove thrombus now is over 85 to 86% of the time. Um, you can see compared to the non-endovascular treatment arm that we really are making an impact in patient outcomes, and that's our goal. Next slide. So let's jump over to endovascular aneurysm treatment. You know, that's also a rapidly evolving field. I've been doing it again. I was the first in Oklahoma, so I have a lot of experience, but I've also seen uh, tons of change. The first time I coiled, all we had were the good glammy coils. Um, and the only thing you could do was a direct, I mean, a, what we call primary coiling where we had to get the microcatheter into the aneurysm and fill it with coils. Our goal is the same as neurosurgery. We wanna stop flow into the aneurysm sac that is weakened um, in a rupture and a, an unruptured aneurysm. Um, obviously if ruptured, it's uh, more critical. Um, so you can see the tools, primary coiling. If it's a wider neck, then we will use a balloon sometimes while we place the coils. And if it's a very wide neck, we have many tools now. This is stent-assisted coiling where we jail our microcatheter into the aneurysm and have a second microcatheter in which we deploy the stent. And on the right, we see a flow diverter. Uh, flow diverter technology is rapidly progressing. We use more and more flow diverters, which allows us in a non, mostly non-ruptured aneurysms, but we do some ruptured aneurysms, 
to, to divert flow away from the wall of the aneurysm and allow the aneurysm to gradually shrink with time is a very, very effective tool. Next slide. So subarachnoid hemorrhage due to aneurysm is a, still a devastating disease, 30 to 40,000 individuals in the US a year, still a very high mortality despite very improved um, technologies, uh, detection, early detection and early interventions. Less than 50% will turn to functional independence. 25% died before reaching the hospital. We, heard, we learned about that in medical school and it's changed a little bit. We're moving the needle uh, in a positive direction, but it's still a devastating disease. Next slide. So typical scan, 53 year old, she had three children at the bedside with her, worst headache of her life. She had a left cranial nerve palsy. On the left, you can see the typical blood in the subarachnoid space that shows up as bright in this non-contrast CT head. Also, her temporal horns are beginning to be a little generous. Um, on her CTA, the arrow shows the little bulging PCOM aneurysm. We took her to the cath lab. She has this irregular, about eight millimeter poster communicating artery aneurysm with a pretty nice neck, but also what is called the teeth sign, the irregularity at the dome that's usually the sign of rupture. Her PCOM is patent. Next slide. We were able to get our microcatheter pretty quickly up into the aneurysm. We always test for um, make sure that there are no normal vessels coming off the dome. This is in progress with filling of the aneurysm. Next slide. And we were able to get about six coils in there with very good aneurysm uh, occlusion. Here's the, the uh, lateral view with the natives showing the coils in the aneurysm. She was discharged at 22 days, back to work without a deficit at one month. Um, and she came back for her follow-up at 10 years with no uh, recurrence of the aneurysm. Next slide. So the other thing we treat a lot is uh, this delayed cerebral ischemia, which after you treat a ruptured aneurysm is the next big hurdle to get patients back home. It's a preventable cause of morbidity and mortality, and it affects a big percentage of patients. Actually, 70% of patients will develop some form of vasospasm after a ruptured aneurysm, but 30 to 40% will be clinically uh, significant. Um, we know that the typical treatment is hypertension, euvolemia, but the first rescue treatment is balloon angioplasty or interarterial uh, vasodilators. When blood spills into the subarachnoid space, it's actually toxic to the outer wall. It causes lots of microthrombi, uh, autoregulatory dysfunction, and the vasospasm. Next slide. So here's an example. This is a patient with a ruptured anterior communicating artery that was coiled successfully in a day about day seven. She uh, neurologically had some new right sided weakness, decreased level of consciousness. We watch these patients every day with transcranial Doppler and I actually read every study for my partner that treats aneurysms with me. We personally read every transcranial Doppler study. Um, she had evidence of, of increase in velocities and obvious vasospasm. Uh, we treated this one with just interarterial uh, calcium channel blocker, works really well on relaxing the smooth muscle. And you can use uh, verapamil also. Mecardipine tends to last a little longer. And ideally, you can get balloon angioplasty. Here's a case of A2 uh, vasospasm and distal A1 vasospasm that's pretty severe, where you navigate a small balloon and you can dilate the balloon. Balloon angioplasty tends to reverse uh, symptoms in about 50 to 80% of the time. And it's a little longer durable than the interarterial uh, calcium channel blockers, but we use both. Next slide. So why do I love what I'm doing? And for the medical students that are out there and people in IR, um, this is a rapidly, rapidly changing field. And I've seen many, many, many interventions and things just getting better. We. Uh, are really involved in patient management. Um, just like Dr. Desai said, we have to be involved in the critical care management of these patients, recognizing the complication, but we are in lockstep with a multidisciplinary team. Um, we always talk about blood pressure parameters, what we're doing and looking at the imaging and, and letting our neurosurgery colleagues and our neurologists that are intensive, neurointensivists know what's going on and what we're planning for the patients. So we do, uh, uh, participate in ongoing trials. Um, we really positively interact with patients and families and have the ability to impact lives. Next slide. 
here's my team. That's one of my body IR partners. Um, we actually have six people doing stroke call. I started out by myself doing stroke call by myself for about five years, and that's really not sustainable. Um, my family was going to leave me if I didn't get some help. Uh, but we have very well-trained vascular interventionists and another neurointerventionist that worked with me and a great team. This is a team approach uh, with very dedicated people. Next slide. That's my daughter. Um, and so for those of you, 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 your mothers, just remember that we're right about everything. Thank you very much. And thank you for the invi 